What are the problems that you see in the world? Um, and then let's look at them through this different lens and say, okay, well, some of the things you think cause inflation are not actually causing inflation, it's something else. Um, some of the things that you think are true about Bitcoin and how it's damaging the environment are not actually true. Let's take a look at it in a more subtle way. So um, it's, the book touches upon each one of those things in its own chapter and then ends with sort of a conclusion to say like, hey, you can, you know, you can do more, you can go reach out into whatever sphere of influence that you have. Um, and, you know, we just need more a more diverse set of voices in the Bitcoin space. And so my real hope for the book is that it provides people the comfort to get into the space and actually speak their mind and talk about how to use Bitcoin to, to produce the better version of the world that they see. Money and our monetary policies and systems are not something that people usually think about, right? <laughs> um, it's just sort of like money is a thing that I use to buy groceries or, or pay my bills. And so the first step is just to get people to understand that money is a technology and it has evolved over time and there's been constantly improvements to it and different experiments and things that we've we've tried and then understanding that the the monetary system that we have now uh, in the United States in particular is is essentially rigged to benefit the people in power with connections who already have the money and so you have a system where the newly printed money that we get into our system sort of doesn't flow equally throughout the entire system so it's Cantillon effect where the people in power who are closest to the banks who are closest to the central bank have access to that freshly printed money and that benefits them in a way where they can then go and buy um, you know, store of value resources that other people can't. And then uh, when you introduce new money into the system, that causes inflation, which of course we're seeing now. And then that puts middle income, lower income folks who are just trying to get by. They don't have access to those resources. They don't have access to those assets. And so they're struggling to get by. The price of the things that they need is going up and everybody sort of at the top of the pyramid gets the benefit, the monetary policy that the United States uh, sort of imposes on the rest of the world. So not only do you have that exasperation of inequality happening in part because of this monetary policy, but America then sort of exports their monetary policy to the rest of the world, forces other countries to use dollar denominated debt and use the US dollar in ways that is a disadvantage to them. Um, and so you end up with this situation where the United States is powerful because they have the global reserve currency and they're dictating their will on other poor, smaller nations. And so all of this, right, whether it's people at home who are struggling because of inflation and not getting the advantages of the monetary system or people around the world, all of that points towards sort of a progressive ideal set that the current monetary system is not working for people. People feel that even if they're not into Bitcoin, but they might not see that, that problem through the Bitcoin lens. It's interesting. I think that what people kind of have a sense that like different things are used for money throughout history, right? So like salt, gold, seashells, right? Like we know that that's true. Um, and then you have to dig into like, well, what's like what makes something a good form of money and what makes it valuable and uh, you know there's different characteristics that you need um, and you know for thousands of years gold served that purpose really well um, the problem with you know one of the problems with gold is very heavy hard to move around how to, hard to secure hard to transport hard to verify um, otherwise it's great right <laughs> like you have um, you know but I think that what ends up happening is over time you end up with this sort of money which is gold and then this currency which is paper and you can trade in the paper and get your gold back at any time but in the meantime it's very easy to sort of move paper around um, and so you know that seems to be a natural transition except you know after the Federal Reserve was formed in 1914 you end up in a situation where uh, they're holding on the gold reserves after um, FDR comes into power, like he confiscates all of the gold from the American public, says, all right, you need to bring in gold except for these very you know, few exceptions, and we'll give you dollars in exchange, um, which at the time was a totally bizarre situation. Like that had never really happened before, not in America. There's lots of reasons why you say, okay, well, let's gang, let's, let's group together, let's do the right thing, let's give the government our gold because we're in a recession and we need to do, you know, a Great Depression, that kind of thing. And then we can trust the government with these papers. And then FDR, you know, a couple of months later, uh, slashed the value of gold, inflated the, the dollar amount, um, and said, so like the dollars that you gave your gold for, if you gave one ounce, you know, a few months ago, 
with the paper you have now, you can only buy you know, a fraction of that. So you end up with this situation where the, the connection between gold and the paper starts to get tenuous. Um, and then gold is outlawed, like you know, the American citizen can't own gold as an investment vehicle, as a store of value, it's just outlawed um, until the 70s. Um, and then, so it, over time, you end up with this sort of gradual, like, um, deterioration of that connection between gold and, and paper, the dollar bills that, that we know, uh, until the point where um, that gold window was completely closed in the 70s by Richard Nixon. So like that severed sort of the international connection between gold and, and paper dollars. Um, and so now we're just based on a completely fiat system where you, like the dollar bills that you have can't be traded in for any hard money, like any real valued asset. Um, and so you're just trusting that um, you know, in the faith and credit of the U.S. government to back those dollars, it's it's hard. You know, dollars are easy money in the sense that they're easy to create. Gold is a hard money because it is difficult to create. It's hard to create. Um, and what we've done is we've traded out our entire economic system and gotten away from gold and into this paper dollars. And now it's sort of zeros and ones on computers everywhere. These ledgers that our banks have. Um, and that is just a detachment from sort of like real production, real like uh, like value in the real world is all sort of abstracted into these dollars um, and, and this paper. So there's a lot of history. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of different avenues that we could talk about. Um, and ultimately, we're at this point now where everybody is just forced to use dollar bills or the dollars that they have in their bank account um, and not really thinking about like, why is that money? Like, why is that good money? Does money have to come from the government? Like these are really good questions to be asking yourself. Um, and then you kind of flip it on its its head and say, well, um, if I can get past the idea that money has to come from the government, which has not historically been the case, um, then what does make good money? And the properties that you want in good money, Bitcoin has all of them. Um, you know, so it's scarce. Um, it's verifiable, it's easy to transport, it's portable, uh, you know, it's divisible. All of the things that we really want in to have something be a good monetary technology Bitcoin has, um, except possibly acceptance, right? So like, people need to accept it and that's, we see that increasing all the time. Um, and so ultimately you end up with this version of gold, you know, Bitcoin is this version of gold that's actually better than gold because you can transport it around the world instantly. and almost instantly. Um, you can secure it with not a huge investment. Um, and it's hard money, like it's hard, to, it's scarce. It's hard to, to make more Bitcoin or impossible at some point. Um, and so you have this property of money that dollars will never have because you know dollars are easy. It's, a, it's literally a button press and more dollars exist. Um, and that happens for free. There's no marginal cost to create a dollar. So its value, uh, the value of the dollar will trend towards its marginal uh, cost to produce, which is zero. And we see that happening all the time, uh, you know, with inflation and prices going up, the value of your dollar, you know, most people think about inflation as prices going up instead of the value of their money going down. But if you're a Bitcoiner, you usually think about the value of your money going down. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening with dollar bills. That's what's been happening with dollar bills for the last century at plus. Um, and so this idea that, well, candy bars used to cost this when I was a kid and now they cost this, like this is just a common conversation. Or look at the prices at the grocery store. Um, you know, this is a conversation I have all the time with family, extended family, <laughs> like, oh my God, I can't believe how much things cost. That wasn't always the case. In the 1800s, uh, when the United States was on a gold standard that was pretty, you know, it was adhered to pretty regularly, prices would go up sometimes, but they would also go down. And so the sort of price fluctuations you would see in the monetary supply and the cost of things, uh, you know, from 1800 to 1899 was, was fairly flat. And so like you probably, if you were a kid in 1899, you weren't hearing stories about how, you know, how much was a candy bar when you know, my grandma was a kid. Uh, you have like a, a large stretch of time where prices are pretty stable. Um, and of course, that's not the case now. Um, prices, you know, inflation is happening, monetary supply is expanding. All of that is sort of a function of the monetary system that we have and the need for, for the United States government to um, service its debt and to, and to make sure that that inflation is helpful for you know, a debtor like the United States government because it makes the real value that you have to pay off uh, less. So 
There's lots of reasons why uh, it's, it is the way it is now. Um, there's lots of different avenues of history to go down. Um, certainly the history of money is fascinating and, and something that people don't usually think about. Um, but the, the kind of the mess we're in right now is a function of lots of different things converging at the same time. Um, and the solution that we have in Bitcoin is sort of a new way of thinking about money that we really haven't had before. And so it's exciting that we might actually have sort of a, a path forward for a more um, prosperous future, a more fair future, more uh, like uh, more equality, more equity. Um, and, and that's what excites me about Bitcoin. The great thing about Bitcoin is that it touches on everything because money touches on everything. And, and again, money is one of those things that people don't usually think about, but it is in many ways the base layer of society, right? You need to have economic uh, activity, you need to trade with people, you need to do commerce, you need to buy things, you need things. Um, and so what's fascinating about it is once you start to think about money in that way, then um, then first of all, if you're into Bitcoin, then you, you have to be a lifelong learner because it does intersect with politics and social structure and economics and all of the things, you know, international, global geopolitics. All of those things are touched upon in this realm of money. And so to understand Bitcoin, you have to understand all of those things, at least at some level. You have to understand the math behind Bitcoin at least a little bit. You have to understand the computer science at least a little bit. And so really, if you're a lifelong learner, like Bitcoin is a gift because it's forcing you into all of these different avenues. And I've, I've learned a tremendous amount in the time that I've been in Bitcoin uh, about the energy sector or about geopolitics or about how monetary systems work in other places. So really, you know, money is that base layer of all of society globally. And so the fact that Bitcoin is the best monetary technology that we have means that um, if somebody, if I'm approaching a conversation with somebody about Bitcoin, there is some avenue, there's some issue, there's some topic that they care about, that they think that the world is heading in the wrong direction, or they're really passionate about this thing that they care about, then it should be possible for me to find a way that Bitcoin intersects with that interest or that desire to learn more. Um, and so as an educator, as somebody who cares about Bitcoin, that's sort of my goal is to meet the person where they are, is to learn what are you interested in? What do you care about? Um, do you care about the environment? Do you care about women's rights in, in, in America and beyond? Do you care about you know, the way that you know, imperial forces are sort of forcing you know, poor nations into you know, a trajectory of, of being poor uh, indefinitely? Like all of these things are important to somebody. You know, or somebody, everyone's gonna have something that they really care about. And so if you find out what that is, or you know that person well, then you can actually approach them and talk about what they care about. And Bitcoin is gonna tie into that somehow because you're not gonna be able to do humanitarian work in some countries without like money that can't be confiscated. You care about the environment well, if you really like renewable energy sources, then you need to understand how Bitcoin helps, um, you know, helps renewable energy sources. If you care about inequality and, and big banks hurting everyday people in America, which you know, a lot of people do care about, then learning about Bitcoin is, is gonna be important on that path too. So my goal is always to sort of not tell them what they should care about, um, is to just sort of listen and understand what they, you know, what it is that they care about and what they're passionate about and then sort of tie Bitcoin, try to tie Bitcoin into that. Um, and the other big thing, in that is, you know, most of the people I talk to are Americans who live in America and are very privileged to have a monetary system that by and large works. When I go to the store and I tap my debit card, like it works, like I don't have any issues, like my bank isn't necessarily confiscating money from me or anything like that. Um, but in most other places in the world, that's not the case. The, you know, the monetary system, uh, you know, the technology isn't reliable. It doesn't work. Um, you know, authoritarian leaders can confiscate funds, can stop them from coming into a country, can siphon off from the top if, if you have aid coming into a country. So there's lots of places in the world where like the money is broken, like it doesn't actually work the way that we want it to. Um, and it's hard for Americans to see that sometimes because they get to go to the store and just tap what they, whatever they want, their debit card works. Um, but in most of the places in the country it doesn't. And so the idea that um, that Bitcoin can help people elsewhere in other nations, in the global south and poorer nations and nations that have authoritarian leaders 
um, is more of an abstract notion for a lot of Americans um, because they don't need to really worry about their money working, which is a huge gift and privilege, right? Like, I mean, historically, there's not been very many, you know, it, it's really a blip, uh, it, it, this current monetary system that we have in America. So the fact that we might have to imagine a, a situation that doesn't work is, is difficult for some people. Well, the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that it, Bitcoin itself is an apolitical tool. Um, there's no politics written into the code of it. It just sort of is what it is. It works. We know that it works. It's reliable. Um, and it's a tool that people can use for whatever ends that they want to use it for. So Bitcoin itself, like in a very technical aspect, doesn't adhere to any sort of progressive or liberal agenda. It just is a monetary tool. Um, what you know, what is also true is that m like money uh, is lives and resides within a political sphere, right? So politicians care about money a lot. They care about the United States monetary policy a lot. They probably are going to care a lot about Bitcoin uh, more and more <laughs> as the years go through. Um, and so like my goal is not to say, okay, Bitcoin needs to be used for these progressive ideas or this agenda that I have. It is saying, Bitcoin is a tool that can be used for good, for bad, for anything in between. And in order for Bitcoin to really th truly thrive and succeed, we need um, a, a complement of voices in the space that can talk about, hey, you care about, you, you, maybe somebody else cares about making the government super small and reducing taxes or something like that. And I care about these other issues and let's use Bitcoin. Let's get people together, understanding what Bitcoin is and using it for their own purposes. But the technology itself isn't political, which is great. Um, it just sort of becomes politicized because it's money and money exists within a political sphere right now. So um, it's just important to make sure that that all voices are included in that conversation because it ultimately makes Bitcoin stronger. It helps with adoption and it helps protect it. If there's a um, if, if Bitcoiners exist along the entire political spectrum, it becomes a lot harder to sort of stamp down on it or to outlaw it or to you know go after the exchanges or whatever it is that the government might decide to do with it. If there's broad consensus political support for Bitcoin, then that's less likely to happen, which is what I think we all would hope for. There's a very short list of things that have bipartisan support right now, um, for sure. And, and that's distressing, right? And that's one of the reasons that I decided to write my book, which is, if we allow Bitcoin to become this right-wing, Republican, conservative thing, then half of the country is going to just dismiss it immediately and not give it any thought um, and not sort of dig deep into the nuance of it. If we can avoid that and we say, all right, well, Bitcoin isn't a political thing. It just sort of exists and we can use it however we want. It's no longer a political football where one side is playing off of the other. Then I think that helps America. I think that we then we have sort of policies that protect consumers, but also promote innovation with Bitcoin. But then it's also less fighting like, OK, I'm going to say bad things about Bitcoin because my constituency likes that. And I'm going to say good things about Bitcoin to get more voters. It just sort of aligns. You know, the hope is that people on the left and the right can align. I do think that Bitcoin provides a unique opportunity for that to happen. I'm not uh, under any illusions that that's a, a guarantee. Um, it's, a, it's a hope, though. It's an aspiration that we can get people, politicians, elected politicians in the U.S. and elsewhere on both sides of the political aisle to agree on Bitcoin and agree on its potential and how we could help uh, support this technology and, uh, and stop from stifling it. I think there's a possibility that that could happen, but it's certainly not a guarantee and it, re it requires work and advocacy and education, which is why you know me and a lot of other people are trying to do that. Yeah, one of the great things about Bitcoin and like the culture that's popped up around Bitcoin is this low time preference, like not sort of reacting immediately to what your needs and desires are in this exact moment. Um, you know, delay gratification, all of this stuff, right? And so one of the things that we see is like the sort of the consumer mindset that we have right now is like, I want it now and I want as much as I can get. Um, that's because in part, it's human nature, but in, uh, in another large part, it's because, well, the money in your pocket is evaporating, like the value, the purchasing power of the money is going down all the time. So you're not incentivized to save. You're, um, if you want to have money as a store of value, you have to learn how to invest it at this point. You can't just like put it in a bank account. You're going to lose purchasing power too. And I think that 
that's one of the things I really appreciate about Bitcoin is saying like, let's think about what life looks like in 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 years, not what it looks like the next quarter. What do the profit statements look like for the next you know, report? Uh, what about the next four years for the election cycle? Like it sort of transcends all of that because you're thinking about long-term stuff. Um, and a lot of the problems that we have um, in our world require long-term thinking. It's not gonna, we're not gonna get there with sort of how do I get elected in two to four years? Um, you know, in the book I talk about this idea of cathedral thinking where you have cathedrals in, you know, Europe that were built over the course of like, you know, 500 years. And, um, and generations of people devoting like a life's worth of work into a building that they'll never see completed. Um, and those are some of the problems that we have now require that kind of thinking, right? Like the idea that we're going to, you know, protect the environment and reduce global climate change is one of those things that requires long-term thinking. You can't say, well, what, what do my profits look like this quarter? It requires generations of people working towards something that they might not see the end of. Um, and I think Bitcoin helps put us all in that mind frame. And I do think that politicians hopefully would come around to that too, because you're, you're forced to be in a situation where you can't just sort of you know, write your own check to get out of a problem and say, okay, I'm just print some more money and, and that will fix that. Um, there's no way to print more Bitcoin. So you're going to have to like do work to solve a problem. You're going to actually have to do something of value to get more Bitcoin or whatever the case is. So it requires you to, to actually do uh, foundational things on the ground with real world life implications. But Part of that is also that long-term thinking, that, that low time preference, where I'm gonna think about my future, I'm gonna think about my kids' future, I'm gonna think about the future of the world, I'm gonna think about the future generations in ways that we really are, um, unfortunately, we're, we're missing today. Like it's just, um, everybody is in this mindset of like, what can I get now? Um, how can I get the most of it? And not thinking about the future. And Bitcoin helps alleviate some of that, I think, because um, it, it's it's when you see your purchasing power sticking around, you're going to buy things, but you're not you're not incentivized to just purchase and consume and then throw something out and get a new one. You just go about the world in a different way. When when you have to think, well, is this worth? You know, this might be worth twenty dollars, but is it worth the equivalent amount of Bitcoin? I don't know. <laughs> you know, so you're making purchasing decisions from the ground up very differently, and I think that's true for the for the general population, and probably true for politicians eventually if we get there. My wife and I are in the market for a new blender now, right? And like, you know, it's frustrating because we bought the blender we have and it's starting to break and yeah it's one sort of pithy example but I said to her I said like my grandmother bought one blender her whole life she bought that when you know she got it as a wedding gift when she was like 20 and like she you know the thing could have been buried with her it still worked you know when she died at 80 right so th that doesn't happen anymore there, there's not even if you were willing to spend more money there's nothing that you can buy that is actually meant to last um, including buildings and including blenders and and cars and computers and phones everything in between you have this planned obsolescence because the the company is built on growing because you have this sort of monetary like the monetary base inflation. So in order to actually make money, you constantly have to be growing. And that means you have to be selling more and more. Like companies are not incentivized to treat their customers in a way that says, I'm gonna give you a quality product, you're gonna have it the rest of your life. That's just not the way it is anymore. Um, and I think that Bitcoin ha at least gives a hope that maybe we start thinking differently. If everybody in the world is a Bitcoiner and thinking about Bitcoiners, like we're not buying the cheap plastic crap anymore. We're gonna buy the quality thing that's gonna last. Um, and whether that's a blender or a house or a car or like a building or a government or whatever, it, it, we're gonna be thinking about long-term things. And I think that's a really, really positive um, sort of cultural phenomenon that's grown within the Bitcoin uh, community is that, that long-term thinking, that low time preference. One of the misconceptions about uh, sort of the environment is that like any energy use is going to be bad. Um, and so you see this a lot where people just make claims like oh, Bitcoin wastes energy or look how much energy Bitcoin is, is using. Um, so first and foremost, we have to understand that like energy use is needed and an important part of our society. Um, and that's true around the world. We see flourishing when energy is being used like then that happen, you know better medicine, better food, better quality of life, like that's part of society. 
Um, and when you're analyzing whether or not something is using too much energy, like you need to think about what are the trade-offs, what are the benefits that you're getting from it, and, and why. And uh, Bitcoin's energy use is primarily from um, the proof of work machines, you know, ASICs working to secure the network, which is an important aspect of the Bitcoin protocol because without it, you can have attacks and sort of people can hack into the system or, you know, change what, what they want. But that can't happen because we're devoting a lot of energy to protecting the network. Um, and so first and foremost, it's important to understand that just energy use in and of itself is not necessarily bad. Uh, if what you're getting out of that energy use is valuable, then it's a good use of energy. Um, and then you can talk, you can have conversations about, well, can we make it more efficient? Could we get the same thing and use less energy? Like, where is that energy coming from? Is it coming from renewable sources? Is it coming from sustainable sources? And so all of those conversations are happening in Bitcoin all the time, right? Like, we're trying to make the machines more efficient. We're trying to invest in places where, that have, like, energy that is being underutilized or not used at all, stranded, stranded energy sources. Um, renewable energy sources. So first and foremost, like that's that's A1A is like just because the energy is being used doesn't mean it's bad. The second thing is a lot of people don't really understand how our electrical grid works even at a foundational level or uh, that just saying well let's use more wind and solar and that will solve the problem. Like there are problems with that. There are inefficiencies baked into um, any renewable energy source. Um, you know it's very dirty to burn coal uh, or oil to like create electricity, but it's super reliable and like can happen all the time and you never have to worry about clouds or wind dying down, right? So you have this intermittent energy source in renewables where a lot of people on the left want to see those happen, including me, but you have to find a way to balance out the grid in terms of these renewable, like, uh, sorry, the renewable energy sources being intermittent where sometimes the sun isn't shining and sometimes the wind isn't blowing, like, or you get more energy than you need. Like, what is the solution to all of that? Um, and one of the things that we can do is build out our renewable capacity to be more than what we need um, so that we can actually uh, service the electricity, the electricity demand that we need. Um, and because we're creating more than we need, like Bitcoin mining can sort of take the excess, which isn't, taking electricity away from anybody um, that needs it, but we're, create, we're using the solar and the wind energy that nobody's using in that moment. Um, and the, and the, unique, um, the unique characteristic about Bitcoin mining that helps is that it has this demand response feature where a Bitcoin miner can be powered down instantly in response and perfect, uh, synchronized perfectly to the demand that is needed. So if all of a sudden there is an increase in demand because there's a heat wave and more people are turning on their air conditioners, Bitcoin miners are able to power down in like real time to give that energy back to the grid that it's that is demanding it. And so you end up with a situation where this demand response makes it possible for renewables to actually be an option for um, for consumers, for large energy grids, for power companies in a way that no other technology can, uh, at least none that, that we've seen. We have other examples of technology uh, like aluminum smelting is a, is a common example that can do this demand response, but there's such limitations about how quickly it can do it, for how long it can do it, when it can do it, that Bitcoin mining is, is really the perfect solution to all of that. So, um, if, if you're a person who's curious about Bitcoin and you're worried about the environmental impact and you also think that like solar and wind are important components to moving towards a renewable future for electricity generation, then Bitcoin mining is at this point, um, it, it's, um, it's inescapable to get to your goals without Bitcoin mining at this point. So we need to have that, uh, that capacity to power up and power down as needed in perfect concert with the demands of the electrical grid. Um, and uh, to do it in a way that is not taking electricity from anybody else that needs it, right? Like a lot of Bitcoin miners, and increasingly so, are using stranded energy where, you know, not all electricity is created equally. So a lot of electricity might be created in a sunny place out in the middle of nowhere, but there's no people around to use it. Or in a waterfall that's remote, but there's not a lot of people to use it. And you can't just pack that energy up and, and take it somewhere, right? It has to be used. Electricity needs to be used or stored the moment that it's create, generated. And so Bitcoin mining helps alleviate all of those issues. It can also help bootstrap these economic, help 
bootstrap the build out of renewable sources because it provides an economic incentive to do so. So it might not make economical sense to say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to produce electricity in this rural uh, you know, outside of this rural town in Africa because they have a waterfall because there's no demand for it. There's no electricity there right now, so nobody's going to use the electricity that I generate. Well, if I put a Bitcoin miner in there or you know, a set of Bitcoin miners to use that electricity as I generate, then the electricity comes online, it becomes available to that village. As the demand grows within that village for the electricity being generated, then the Bitcoin miners can back off and then go and bootstrap another project somewhere else. And that can happen in America. America or, or elsewhere too. Um, so there's a lot of components where you say, okay, well, there's wasted energy all over the place. How can we actually utilize that energy? How can we incentivize the build out of more renewable energy? Bitcoin mining has a place in all of that. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's purely a market-driven incentive system where you say, all right, well, I want to find the cheapest electricity to run my Bitcoin miners because that's going to make it the most profitable. Well, where is the cheapest electricity? It's where electricity is being created that people aren't using. Um, and so this idea that, oh my goodness, Bitcoin's using all of this energy is missing the fact that like, well, a lot of the energy it's using is going to be sort of burnt off, throttled down, not used, wasted anyway, um, because Bitcoin miners are incentivized to find that cheapest electricity. And it's not as if we're taking electricity away from hospitals just to mine Bitcoin, right? Like we're going places where the electricity is being generated but not able to be used, that's super beneficial, not just to Bitcoin miners, but it's also like financially incentivized to do that. But it also helps this build out that I was saying before. It's like it actually helps um, build out that renewable energy sources that we really need if we want to sort of create a sustainable um, energy mix here or abroad. And that's I think that's one of the most beautiful things about Bitcoin is that right now for a poorer nation to actually get um, to get some economic benefit, they need to essentially come with their hat in their hand to the I, you know, the World Bank or the I, uh, IMF where is saying they're getting, um, you know, turn, they're getting loans from these international organizations that are essentially run by the United States in terms that are not favorable to them. Uh, they have to pay back debt in like hard, harder currencies like the dollar instead of their local currencies. Um, and Bitcoin provides an opportunity for a nation that fits that category to say, all right, well, I'm going to use our, the natural resources that we have, like hydro, wind, solar, to generate Bitcoin, which is not controlled by the United States. It's not controlled by the IMF or the World Bank. Like they actually have this financial sovereignty now uh, because they're devoting their natural resource. Instead of exporting out natural resources to wealthy Western nations, um, they actually can use them to generate like a a secure financial like monetary technology like Bitcoin, um, that's super powerful because it sort of flips the tables in terms of power. Like we're no longer coming to you and asking for loans in terms that are favorable to you. We're going to generate our economic activity by devoting some of our natural resources to generating Bitcoin. And a lot of these places are resource rich but sort of economically colonialized in a way that disadvantages them. And if we can break that cycle and say, all right, well, these, these poor nations are no longer going to be sort of uh, relegated down to like being poor forever. They can actually use their resources for some financial gain. Um, and Bitcoin allows that to happen in a way that the current financial system doesn't. Like, I think that helps, uh, that helps people in the world that actually need it. Coming out of World War II, there, there's this monetary system uh, referred to as Bretton Woods, where you're, um, where all of the nations that were coming out of World War II, at, at least on the victor side, agreed that the United States dollar would be the global reserve currency, and all of the other currencies that existed in the world would be pegged to that dollar. Um, and so we essentially got rid of this, like it's no longer a gold standard, it's sort of a US dollar standard um, for all of the currencies in the world. And so in order for that to happen and to be stable, you needed to have a monetary fund that would sort of be able to balance out the ebbs and flows of those currencies. So the IMF into it, that's the original purpose that it served to say, okay, well, we're going to have gold and we're going to have dollars and we're going to have francs and we're going to have pounds and that we're going to be able to sort of monitor all this so that that the the 
the exchange rate between a dollar and a yen or a dollar and a pound is always going to be what we say it is. Um, and that was the monetary fund in, in basic terms. And the World Bank was established to provide loans to nations that needed to rebuild after World War II. Um, and uh, certainly those had really important purposes and actually did a lot of good in the world when they were conceived and implemented in the 40s. Um, but since then, uh, the like the thread has been lost, right? We're no longer on a gold standard. Uh, there's no like uh, dollar peg to, you know, to gold. Um, and so all of it, the minute that Nixon sort of closed the gold window, all of the currencies are now sort of free floating against one another. And there's a lot of people going in and making money off of those minute changes all the time, right? So like these are not actually people that are adding value to the world. They're just making money off of like arbitrage opportunities with like a currency exchange seems horrible um, but like that so the the IMF is really no longer needed and the World Bank like you know Europe bounced back like from World War II like all of the nations that were sort of demolished and damaged built up uh, again so the economies worked well so like that had achieved its purpose also but you have these large institutions that need to exist and need to sort of rewrite their purpose for existing and so it becomes this you know in the in the 60s and 70s both of those institutions, which are intertwined with one another, uh, sort of rewrote, instead of their original purposes, oh, now we're gonna alleviate poverty all around the world, we're gonna provide loans and monetary help to these nations that need help to alleviate poverty. And unfortunately, they just do it in a way that exacerbates poverty because, you know, essentially creating um, a dependency on this money coming in from these international organizations. Um, they're provided loans in ways that mean that they need to export certain resources to certain countries that are more wealthy and powerful. Uh, they have to pay back the loan in dollars, which are, is a harder currency for, uh, than their, their local currency. And so what they end up doing is they get another loan to pay off the other loan, and they just get in the cycle of debt. And so um, the, the current functioning of the IMF and the World Bank is, is polar opposite to what it's saying it's doing, which is to alleviate poverty. It's actually creating more poverty and more food scarcity and food de dependence and resource scarcity um, in all of these poor nations to the benefit of Western European American you know, economies. And so we've lost the thread on that a little bit. Um, and it's actually, you know, those large international organizations are actually doing more harm uh, than, than I think most people realize. And their, their mission statement is completely different than what it was when they originally were adapted in the 40s after World War II. I, I mean, ultimately, that does account for a lot of the affluence that we have in America, which is to say, um, you know, through these monetary instruments, through the World Bank and the IMF, we can dictate to a nation like, oh, that crop that you have used for the last thousands of years to feed your people, we don't want that. We want you to grow this other thing um, and then export it to our country, right? So like a good example is say, stop growing rice, uh, flood all of your rice fields with salt water, grow shrimp, and then export the shrimp to us. And oh, you can't feed yourself because you don't have rice anymore. Well, you can buy our grain that we grow in America and we'll send it to you, right? So that you have this dynamic where it creates this dependency on, you know, just this food dependency. I used to be able to feed myself, but now I can't. And also America is getting all, it's not just shrimp, that's one example, but all of these other things. Garlic is <laughs> another uh, common example of people mentioned, right? Where it's like all of a sudden, you know, you might get this loan from the IMF, but in the last minute, like the, gar the, the garlic lobby is saying like, oh, tell them they can't grow garlic anymore or something. So you end up with these situations where these poor nations, like the, the, their, their cash crops or their, their crops that they use to feed themselves are no longer even allowed to be grown and then that creates a dependency on America and what is being grown are luxury goods or uh, natural resources are being mined or, or used up and sent to these other uh, more wealthy nations and it creates a sense of abundance in, a, in America and in Europe that doesn't even match up with like what things would look like on a, on a fair playing field right like uh, almost all Americans have more than they would otherwise without this taking advantage of, of poor nations. Yeah, I, I, people ask me that a lot. Like, how do we get to this point? Um, and and usually it's a question of, well, like, are the people in charge evil? Are they making bad d decisions? Are they making mistakes? Um, and I don't think that any of that's true. I don't think that the people in power, by and large, are like evil people. 
um, I think that we just have systems in place that sort of incentivize this behavior. Um, and there certainly there are people who are who are baddies who are like, all right, I'm going to institute this policy. But for, by and large, I think that we have these large international organizations, um, a large federal government um, with politicians that don't really fully un understand like the impact of monetary policy apart from like maybe what they read in headlines. Um, and they're just making decisions that seem to be optimal decisions like in that moment or that makes sense to get more votes in that moment. Or um, I'm sure many people who work at the IMF and the World Bank think that they're doing good by providing these loans to the, these nations and then saying, well, we want you to do it this way because that's the way it works in America, so do it this other way and then you'll become prosperous, but in effect that's not what's happening. So I think that there's, there's a lot of good people stuck in systems that are flawed and institutions that are flawed and are being presented with incentive structures that are perverse in the way that like ultimately what we hope to have happen in the long run is not going to happen in this way. Um, so I, I think, yeah, it's a hard question, like how do we get to this point? Uh, like I said before, historically there's lots of paths that got us here and lots of things that we can explore. Um, but I don't think it's a result of like a few bad people um, or politicians now. I don't think most politicians could be able to tell you, even in America, like how do, how's money created? How, like what is, what is the use of the central bank? Like why is it important, you know? I don't think they can answer those questions, to be honest with you. They're just trying to go day by day, do the right thing, and then get reelected. Um, and so it's just, uh, unfortunately, just sort of where we are. We have a broken monetary system that does not incentivize um, good faith acting, uh, like accurate economic information being put out there. Uh, it incentivizes short-term thinking. Uh, from both companies and uh, government officials. So I think that's kind of where we, you know, where we are where we are now because of a lot of people being incentivized to think short term inside large organizations which aren't really nimble and able to act to realities on the ground. And we end up with this big mess that we have now, which I don't think that there's many people who like are paying attention who are like, oh yeah, things are going really well. Like on both sides of the political spectrum, I think that people are saying like, man, the world is kind of crazy right now. Um, and they're not quite yet able to make that connection to like the underlying monetary structure that like undergirds the whole system. The whole system is kind of messed up and negative and bad. I read a lot of bad news, but like that's not to have anything to do with like using green paper money. I think that Bitcoiners are trying to get, like open people's eyes to the fact that there's actually is probably a connection there and we need to, to understand it better. What's interesting, you have this debate between uh, people like, oh, I want a bigger government or I want a smaller government. Um, and that's fine, like you can have that debate. I think right now that is framed in a certain way. It's just not sort of intellectually honest. I think that um, uh, both political parties in the United States, um, at least, uh, spend a lot of money. Um, and they do it in a way that just requires the government to take on more debt, which then requires us to print more money and issue more uh, bonds and, and debt to, to, the, to the market. And none of the priorities that any politicians are having right now, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, um, is being paid for because we're saying like, hey, let's, we're going to tax you, but this is why we're taxing you and this is what we're going to use the money for. And you know, that's ultimately the, the hope and the goal. Right now, politicians are getting sort of a blank check to say, we're going to give you these things because we know that you want them, but we're not going to tax you. We're not going to make you pay for it. Um, and I just think it's a more honest conversation. Like, let's have this conversation. Do you want a big government or a small government? But let's pay for everything by like taxing people and like making them have a stake in what their government is doing. Right now, it just feels like this mysterious, like, oh, well, the government's just going to go into more debt. And nobody really thinks about, well, what are the long-term implications of that? Like, that house of cards crumbles at some point. Like, the people who are benefiting now are going to be damaged by that later. Um, and a lot of people like to think that that's an impossibility or the experts will figure it out, but the reality is the reality. Like you have a pretend money, it's not backed by anything, it's easy to make, and that's just going to cause more trouble. So I think the incentives are, uh, at least for the politicians, to say, well, let's keep giving you everything that you want, um, but not asking you to pay taxes or to be involved in the civic uh, dynamic in that way. I think that causes long-term trouble, um, even if it feels 
right in the moment for the voters and it gets the politicians reelected, like it's really just escaping a lot of hard truths about how our economic system is set up. And I think Bitcoin provides a different situation. Bitcoin is saying, well, yeah, you can provide free school lunches to people um, who can't afford it, or you can help pay for community college for people, but we're going to actually have to tax you for that because we can't just print more Bitcoin. If we we're on a Bitcoin standard, it would it would be an honest conversation to say, you know what? Yeah, we're the voters say we like the school lunch thing, but maybe the community college we can't afford that. We don't want that. So like the conversation becomes different instead of saying let's have everything. Um, and not pay for it, and then just have this inflation take take over. We actually have a different conversation between voter and politician that is more fruitful and honest and transparent. We're all taught economics in school at some level. Like you know, I took AP economics. I took economics in, in college too. Um, and you just taught these things that like you grow up thinking, well, it has to be this way. Like you have to have inflation in order to have growth in the economy. Well, that's not true. Um, and you have a lot of very fancy people with fancy mathematical equations who say, well, if, if these assumptions hold, look at all of my equations, it's going to work out. Well, that requires a lot of assumptions, right? And, and people aren't necessarily good at parsing that out. So it makes it seem really, oh, this person's super smart, right? They've won a Nobel Prize. Look at the equations, they all work out without really understanding that those equations are all based on a set of assumptions that are based in like, what's your reality look like? And when the reality changes, then all of those equations fall apart. So things, you know, like Paul Krugman says, like, yeah, a lot of those are probably true under certain circumstances, but the reality is gonna set in eventually. Like, we can't keep just printing money and then thinking that there's no consequences for it, right? And you don't need to be a conservative Republican to say that. Like, like you can have things, you can have a large government even, you just need to be able to find a way to pay for it that isn't sort of printing money and slowly uh, stealing purchasing power away from like the everyday person or like, you know, normal working people. Um, these are all issues that need to be addressed. And I think that the current economic thinking is, well, um, we need a heavy hand. We need a central bank to sort of um, devote their policy to minimizing booms and busts and all of that stuff. The problem is that the incentives are not lined up, right? The fine the central bank is incentivized to sort of not level out booms and busts, but to just avoid the busts completely until it gets so big that like there's like the dams break, right? That's what happened in 2008 and 2009. It's like, well, we have all this prosperity, 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 and then like something goes wrong and it just cascades out of control. That's what's happening. It's not like we're getting rid of like, let booms and busts happen more than we are now, then like people figure it out, right? Like, oh, I have an unprofitable company. I need to like stop doing that and I'll do something that's better or more profitable. Like you're not learning those lessons when the central bank is sort of manipulating the economic policy in a way that it makes like the booms and busts, you know, you're getting rid of those symptoms and then you're not understanding the underlying uh, disease that you're trying to deal with. So I think that the, the classical way of thinking and, and what we we're all taught, like, yeah, it caused a lot of prosperity for people, but like it was built on, you know, what we were saying before, the backs of these poor nations are importing things. It, it, like a lot of America's prosperity isn't because we have these great economic minds with fancy equations. It's because we control the global reserve currencies and we can dictate terms on trade that happens all over the world. We have a strong military and that kind of impacts things in a certain way too. So there's lots of reasons. It's not just like the economic theory was right. And, and further, the whole idea that, you know, we're, we're not even really practicing Keynesian economics in the way that it was intended in the first place, right? Like, oh, we have high government spending when we need to get ourselves out of the recession, and then we'll increase taxes and lower our spending in, in good times. We don't do that. You know, we're not, there's no politicians, oh, look at how well things are going, let's increase taxes now and reduce our spending. It just is always up, right? It's a ratchet, it goes up and up and up. So what we're dealing with is not actually like Keynesian economics either, right? It's actually just sort of this perverse idea to say, oh, well, Keynes said that we can just sort of uh, increase spending sometimes and decrease it to help the booms and the bust, but politicians heard that and said, well, we could just increase spending. And so that's not really even a fair assessment of like the mathematical economic theory either. What's being put into practice is perverse version of it that is created by these politicians to say, I don't want a re recession when I'm getting reelected. I want there to be economic uh, progress all the time. I don't want there ever to be a bust and that you can have that happen for a decade, maybe even two, 
But eventually, like, the chickens come home to roost and, like, there's going to be problems. And those problems are a lot bigger after that 20 years of prosperity uh, because it was masking a lot of the problems within the economy. So ultimately, you know, like, I have less faith and less trust in, like, these professional economic uh, economists than I ever did before I got into Bitcoin. A healthy skepticism about, um, well, what are they teaching me? What are they trying to get across? Why has it worked in the past? Where has it failed in the past? These are all critical questions to ask. And, and sort of how does Bitcoin and how does a hard money solution work into all of that? Um, maybe it's not the worst thing in the world to have, um, you know, see what it looks like to have economic prosperity in a non-inflationary world where your purchasing power is protected. Uh, that I think that ultimately produces a better version of the world that I would like to see is to, for people to work hard, save their money, make economic decisions based on um, you know, the reality on the ground instead of being worried that they're going to lose purchasing power if they don't act now. Like All of those things are going to be better for the world if we, do, if we can do it. It's one thing to say, oh, it doesn't matter if the debt to GDP ratio is constant or stays where, where we want it, then everything's fine. Well, maybe that's true, but like, what do you have to do? You see the debt increasing, right? So what do you have to do to get that GDP to increase the same way? It's, it's, it's all sort of, in a sense, it's like smoke and mirrors, right? Like you're creating companies that are not profitable, but they seem profitable because of this inflation. You, you're sort of you're, you're in a mindset that you have to constantly grow and produce more and get people to consume more. And if you're a fan of the environment, like that's not a good solution either. And it's not sustainable, right? Like we live on a finite planet with finite resources and you know there's a certain limit to what we can produce. So your GDP cannot grow indefinitely, exponentially all the time. And so sure, maybe it is true that, oh, if our, if our ratio stays the same, then we have no problems. But like, how does that happen? And can it happen forever? The answer is no. And so what happens when your debt spirals out of control exponentially and your GDP is even growing slowly or not growing, then you end up with a bigger problem than you would have had if you were trying to be more reasonable about it. So I don't, I don't buy the idea that it's just the debt to GDP ratio that is important because in order to maintain that ratio, all sorts of things have to happen and it's not sustainable forever. Um, I do think that we need to be aware of what is, what does the debt look like in real terms? And, and possibly in relationship to that ratio also, but also what is that doing to the monetary supply? What is that doing to inflation? What is that doing to the savings of everyday people versus the debt that the government's taken on? The, go the government's incentivized to have inflation, right? They want to have two, 3% inflation. It's going to sort of chip away at their debt over time so that when they pay it back, it's, it's actually less in real terms. But that's also deteriorating all of the savings accounts in America, all of the people that work for, the, for a living. It's making prices go up for them too. Um, and so you have this, you know, what, what's the cost of that constant growth, that constant debt, that constant, like, I need to produce more. It's, it's harmful to everyday Americans. It's harmful to the environment and it's not sustainable. So you're going to have a bust at some point, no matter what. Um, and the way things are going now, when it happens, it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be pretty catastrophic. We are we are in a spot right now where there are, um, people are struggling to get by. You can see that with grocery bills and rent and all uh, all sorts of things. And um, there's definitely struggle all around the world, and especially in America. And, and people are struggling now in ways that they they probably never had to deal with before. Um, and, and so like, that's sad, and I think inflation is part of that. If the economy takes a, a turn for the worse, then that's going to be pretty bad too. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's one of the side effects of you know, having this inflationary monetary policy where the everyday person just has to work harder and harder for less and less. Um, and at a certain point, you have to feed your family and, and maybe you make bad decisions or you have to escape and, and you can become addicted to drugs and you're dealing with all sorts of um, you know, problems that, that are really an indication that society, like, like fabric of society is, is really getting torn at this point. That's what it feels like to me anyway. Um, and, and so I think the normal, like everybody would want that to be alleviated and, and to help. Um, I think it's it's interesting. I think that Bitcoin has allowed me to see the unintended consequences of a lot of policies that are intended to help um, and alleviate struggling. And uh, you know something like um, you know providing 
uh, you know, interest-free loans for college tuition, right? Well, that's really great because people need to go to college and they need to have a degree so they can make a living. Well, what that does ultimately in the long run is to make college way more expensive and more difficult to achieve for people who can't get those loans or even if they can, then they're going to be in debt for a, for a long time. So you have the, all sorts of things with unintended consequences where people are trying to make the world a better place. Um, and the result of their actions is actually make things harder for the people they're trying to help. Um, and I think, you know, something like taking a look at like, what are the struggles people are having, putting food on the table and making sure that they, they can cover their mortgage or their rent and, um, you know, not become unhoused or something like that. These are really hard societal problems and the government, you know, in my view, the government has some role in, in that. But I think that Bitcoin has allowed me to at least take a step back and say, well, what are the unintended consequences of your policies? Um, is it going to make, you know, even though you're trying to help people find affordable housing, is it going to make housing uh, less affordable in the long run? And so I don't have any necessarily solutions to that. I, I hope that we can transition to a Bitcoin standard so that there's more honest economic activity and a more transparent dialogue between voters and politicians and that will help but ultimately i hope that happens without as much struggle as i think might happen um, you know i don't want people to to turn to bitcoin out of a space of desperation that everything else is ruined um, and i think we still have time and, and that my hope is that people can see this other economic system that works um, and is beneficial to people and society and uh, can actually help people before it's too late or before it's actually like needed desperately. Um, you know, so like one of the examples is a lot of people, because they are making money and their purchasing power is deteriorating, you know, they invest in a home and they buy their house and that is their store of value. Um, and, and ultimately, that's a, that's a sign of broken money, right? Money is supposed to be used as a store of value. That's one of the main in, like use cases of it. Um, and if your money is constantly being deteriorated in terms of its purchasing power, you have to find some other way to preserve that value. Well, for most Americans, at least that's buying a home. Well, what that does is put a monetary premium on homes, right? You're no longer paying just for a place to live, like a dwelling. Um, you're actually paying this like increased monetary premium because we're using houses and homes. Uh, to serve as like one of the functions that our money is supposed to serve as and it makes housing uh, less affordable for people starting out or it's it's just less attainable to own a home now because you know people and companies are buying up homes as a store of value in a way that makes it just unachievable for for normal people with normal jobs to actually own a home now that's not good for society so we're I don't think we're heading in the right direction um, I don't have a silver bullet to solve it but I do think that Bitcoin with a lot of hard work and a lot of education can actually get us on the right track. Um, it doesn't necessarily solve all the problems immediately, but I think it's a it's step zero. The petrodollar is essentially what we all have in our wallets right now, even today. Um, and it really stems from the 1970s where Nixon says, all right, we're going to get off the gold standard. Um, and we're not going to have the dollar tied specifically to like the value of gold anymore. Um, and that's true for international trade and commerce. Um, but there needs to be some other way to like make people uh, incentivized to, you know, in other countries to buy dollars and maybe use dollars for trade instead of like, you know, uh, the currency from some other nation, right? We don't want people using rubles to like trade for stuff, right? So what uh, Nixon did with Henry Kissinger was uh, to convince Saudi Arabia to price oil in dollars. Um, and to exclusively do that. So the only way you can buy oil from Saudi Arabia is to have U.S. dollars, which d increases the demand for U.S. dollars. Um, it strengthens the U.S. dollar by doing that. Um, and, then, uh, and then quickly other oil producing nations followed suit. So essentially you ended up in a situation where you can only get um, you know, oil by, by having dollars. And essentially you have like the monetary system backed on this abundant energy source or, you know, at the time it was this 
ubiquitous energy source. Everybody needed oil uh, to make their economies run and to actually function as societies. And the only way to get that was with dollars. And that was sort of the brainchild of Henry Kissinger and, and a couple of other people in the Nixon administration. And they incentivized um, all of that by saying to Saudi Arabia, hey, you can buy our debt now at like a discounted bonus rate. Um, we'll provide you with weapons to defend yourself. All of this sort of like wheeling and dealing with uh, a nation state that wasn't necessarily like aligned with American ideals. Um, but, um, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows. And so you have this petrodollar system where um, the dollar is kind of backed by oil, which everybody needs. Um, the United States benefits because now they can buy oil with dollars and they can just print the dollars. Um, so they can just get, instead of having to dig the oil out of the ground um, or work really hard to get dollars to buy the oil, um, they can just create as much dollars as they want and buy the oil. Other nations aren't able to do that, including sort of our adversaries during the Cold War aren't able to do that. Um, and so it ends up this whole dynamic where um, not only only is all of that taking place and it puts America at its huge advantage and solidifies the dollar as the um, global reserve currency. Um, but it also provides this perverse relationship with Saudi Arabia where we're looking um, at, you know, the other way to sort of human rights catastrophes and atrocities that are happening since the 1970s, like almost nonstop. And we're still providing them with weapons and, you know, intelligence support and all of that stuff as sort of a military ally. Um, and yet uh, a lot of the ideals that, you know, that most Americans would consider these are American ideals are not you know, upheld in Saudi Arabia. So um, it's, it's essentially this perverse form of, of backing the dollar and making it stronger and making it more desired around the world based on this old system of selling barrels of oil um, that's a detriment not just to you know to the people in America because um, now the dollar is stronger and it's harder to like you know um, there's a phenomenon where like because of the strength of the dollar it's easier and cheaper to like go hire people in other countries right this doesn't just happen in a vacuum like the strength of the US dollar causes like factories in Ohio and West Virginia to close down and like those jobs to go somewhere else so it's not helpful to the Americans have such a strong dollar it's also a detriment to the rest of the world because now they're at a disadvantage in terms of buying oil and getting energy that they need to run their economies um, and certainly it's helped propping up dictators and authoritarian leaders and, and other oil rich nations which we normally I don't think would want to support but um, despite sort of public outcry, all of the presidents that we've had since Nixon have um, talked tough about Saudi Arabia until they get into power and realize the relationship and then sort of backtrack. Um, and so it's really just sort of a flawed system in the sense that um, it, it, it accomplished the goals that it tried to accomplish by strengthening the dollar and putting America at a really strategic advantage during the Cold War. But the way it exists now and, and, and has uh, is a detriment to the American population and the rest of the world. Um, and it's just uh, a really, well, it's like, it's like when I hear petrodollar, it's dirty, like it's oil. It's like, you know, but it's like intertwined, like that, that dirty oil and that country that produces it and the United States dollar is all intertwined now. You can't escape one without the other. I mean, there's lots of examples. I, I talked about this in the book, too, where there's, you know, a bill that is trying to hold Saudi Arabia accountable for the hijackers in 9-11 because most of them came from Saudi Arabia. Or, and, and it had popular bipartisan support in Congress and among the American people. And then the executive was just like, all right, we're going to veto this. It's not good for our relationship with Saudi Arabia. And I, we need that relationship to work because if they start selling oil in, you know, rubles or pounds or Bitcoin or something, that's going to be a problem for us. So you end up in this, like you're saying, you have this perverse relationship where America has to turn the other way, where, okay, we're going to, um, you know, assassinate a journalist. We're not going to do anything about it. We're going to evade another country. We're not going to do anything about it. We're going to have really poor, you know, women's rights. We're not going to do anything about it. We're still going to support this nation and this country and this group of countries. Um, and, and so you end up with this relationship that's not, um, you know, doesn't line up with American ideals the way that most of us would define them. I think that most people understand that, that war is an expensive enterprise, um, but I don't think that most people really understand exactly how <laughs> expensive. Um, and so when you 
when a nation decides to go to war, either to invade another country or to defend themselves, um, there's this calculation that has to happen, right? Like, how much military can we afford? Like, how much, um, you know, people can we have in our army? How much equipment can we have? All of that's super expensive, um, in both treasure and, and blood, obviously. Um, but that money, ever since World War II, that money comes from, at least in the United States component, is just sort of printing money, going into debt, um, and having this sort of free spigot of money that goes towards the military. So if we decide we want to evade a, a, a country in the Middle East and stay there for the next 20 years and have billions and trillions of dollars pour into that country um, and lose lots of lives in the process, like we can afford that without the American population having to like ration their food or their gasoline or pay higher taxes or even buy war bonds, like none of that's happening. Uh, and yet America's at war, you know, off and on in all over the world for decades and decades, and the American people are no longer like feeling a pinch of saying like, all right, well, this war is really important and I understand why I have to ration my butter and my eggs and I have to pay higher taxes because we're at war and that's super important. The American population right now is being asked to sacrifice zero uh, in order for us to be at war and that war is being paid for by printed money, printed dollars um, that aren't you know, essentially tied to any real world energy expenditure. And so the, the, the aspiration is that under a Bitcoin standard, you have a monetary a technology that you can't just make more of. You have to actually put in uh, an expenditure of energy to get more Bitcoin. Then in that world, you go into making decisions about going to war much differently. You say, all right, well, I want to go to war. I want to defend myself. I want to invade this other country for a really good reason. I need to now go to my people in that country and say, we're going to tax you. We're going to ration, you know, whatever. We're going to expect you to buy war bonds or support this process uh, because it's really important. And the, then the population can say yes or no, uh, but it's not this mysterious thing that just happens in the background. Like most Americans aren't like on top of what's happening in the Middle East or in other kind of like our military involvement around the world because we're not being asked to like pay attention to it. It's just money that gets spent because it was printed. Um, there's no real world, real life connection to like expenditure of resources for us. Our quality of life has gone up, presumably, for over the last 20 years for most people, um, and yet we're still, you know, we're still engaging in these conflicts all over the world. So, the the basic premise is to say, if you want to, you you can't eliminate war um, or conflict, but what you can do is make it um, costly in the sense that if in order to engage in a conflict or a war, I need to be intentional about. Um, what it costs me, what it costs my people, and whether or not I want to do it. And the, that decision-making process is going to look a lot different than it does now. Um, so Bitcoin provides an oppor opportunity to do that because you can't just make more of it. So if, if you know, in the future, if all nations were under this Bitcoin standard where everybody was using and accepting Bitcoin, then it's a lot harder. Um, you know, a good example of this is the gold standard, right? Where when nations were going into World War I, <clears throat> all of them immediately jettison the gold standard and said, we're just going to print money to pay for the war. And that makes perfect sense because the other country is doing it too. And if I'm at war with Germany and they've just you know, dismantled their gold standard, I'm going to do the same thing. So I can buy tanks and boots and guns and, and bullets. Um, and that's, I guess that's fine, but it's really easy to jettison the gold standard because gold is heavy and confiscatable and like people generally don't have it. They're just trusting paper money. If you're in a Bitcoin standard and the country says, all right, we're gonna jettison our Bitcoin standard to buy bullets and tanks and boots and guns, um, the populace of that country said, hey, wait a minute, we don't wanna jettison our Bitcoin standard. Like I have my Bitcoin, like it's secured, I have it, I can use it. My shop down the corner will take it and you know I can save it and I can have it under cold storage under my, um, you know, I can custody it myself. So it's a lot different than gold. It's a lot harder for the government to step in and say, hey, we're, we're going to war, we're getting rid of the Bitcoin standard. Like that doesn't happen the same way. Um, and so if the government is being forced to adhere to the standard because the population can actually hold the reserve currency themselves and use it themselves without the need of any bank or government to help them, then it forces the government to, to stay true to that and say, well, 
the tank company is not going to accept these paper, this paper money. They want Bitcoin. Um, the ammunition company is not going to accept paper money. They want Bitcoin. You can't just make more Bitcoin. So you have to go into a decision to go into an armed conflict in a way that says, how am I going to pay for this? Who's going to pay for this? How much am I willing to spend? And that conversation looks a lot different than it does in, in armed conflict right now. Bitcoin is one of the one things in the world right now that makes me hopeful. I mean, there's a lot of bad news, bad headlines, conflict, war, struggle happening all over the place um, in the world. Um, the political scene in America is getting really ugly too. So um, Bitcoin is actually one of those things that gives me hope because I do think that it helps people understand the current economic system that we have better. It provides an opportunity to transition to a better economic system if people learn about it and buy into it. Um, and there's a, a huge cascading effects of that, right? You have a, a totally different incentive structure between politicians and voters. Um, you have a, a monetary technology that can be used to save instead of consume, like endlessly consume, you're incentivized to save now. You don't need to become an expert investor just to have hold on to a store of value. You're not buying a home and pricing people out of, of purchasing a home just to store your value. Um, it can, Bitcoin can provide the opportunity to build out renewable energy, more stable, more secure uh, renewable energy sources all around the world. Um, it has a potential to change how we pay for and fund wars and make wars less deadly, less, uh, less common. So I think uh, all the way around 360 degrees, Bitcoin provides this path forward to a better version of the world the way that I would like to see it. Um, none of those things are guaranteed, right? Even if we were to adopt Bitcoin, it requires work, it requires dedication from people to advocate for what they think is important, what, what are the values that we want to promote, um, how do we want to spend our resources, our time, energy, and money um, towards seeing that better world. Uh, but I think that um, Bitcoin is a step zero for all of that. Like if we adopt Bitcoin and people truly understand its power and the ability to, to take the monetary technology away from um, a powerful institution in the government, then it requires the government to be more transparent, more honest with its people, and then it gives people power to do the things that they want to do without fear of having their money confiscated or frozen or stolen. So I do think that Bitcoin provides the opportunity to, to make the world a better place in lots of different arenas, um, but it's not a guarantee. And I think that there's a message to people who are new to Bitcoin. It's like there's a lot of benefits that can happen in this, in this world if we adopt Bitcoin. Um, and the world might become a better place than what we have now. Um, and a message to people who are already into Bitcoin, it doesn't come for free. You need to work for it. You need to actually help educate people and, and help them see the power and the beauty of Bitcoin as a, a vehicle to make the world a better place. Um, and so that, that's one of the things that gives me hope and optimism about the future is that we have this technology, um, you know, we, we've had economic crises in the past and, and hardships in the past and Bitcoin wasn't around. And we see what happens in that situation. Now, Bitcoin has been established and is there. And so either before the next crisis or during the next crisis, we actually have a lifeboat. We have something, a new version of money that we can get on board with and actually use um, to really productive ends if we can just continue to learn about it and grow the awareness of not only the problems, but the potential solutions through Bitcoin. Fundamentally, the most important thing is to understand Bitcoin as well as you can. And it's a lifelong process. You're never going to stop learning about Bitcoin and its implications. But there's a lot of people who are in elected positions um, who who think that they understand Bitcoin, but it's really at a surface level. It's misconceptions. It's very limited information. So number one message, and this is true for everyday people all the way up to politicians, is just learn about Bitcoin. Try to learn how it works, why it works, why it can, why it's stable, why it's secure, why it can be depended upon, and then what are the secondary characteristics of it? What are the, you know, the long-term thinking, the low time preference, the things that are going to make the world a better place, like why is that also incorporated into the culture of it now too? So to continue to learn and then um, ultimately 
um, meet them where they are. What are your concerns? Like, what are the things that you care about? How do you want to make the world a better place? And then let's talk about how Bitcoin can actually do that because there's answers to all of those things. Um, but I want to meet people where they are. What are their concerns? Where do they see the world going wrong? And what, how can we rein that in or, or change the direction that we're going in? Um, I just want to meet people where they are and educate them and then help them see uh, you know, what we see. Great. Yeah. That's awesome, Gary. Thank you so much. All right. If you want to learn more about why Bitcoin actually benefits our environment, watch this video here. Let us know in the comments below if you enjoyed this format and who you'd like us to reach out to next. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos like this every week. We'll see you next time.